Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for our Tuesday Treasure Program where we go through some of the lesser seen objects in the museum's permanent collection. My name as always is Nicole Carpenter. I'm the Programs and Collections Director here at the Westport Museum for History and Culture. As always, we are pleased to bring you this program free of charge, but we do appreciate any support that you can give the museum. We do have a suggested donation of $5 for all of our programs and we do appreciate your support during this very difficult time. If you have any questions, comments, anecdotes that you would like to share during our program, we do encourage you to enter them in the comments box and we will go through as many of those as we can at the end of our presentation. Today, we are going through the history of some heels as well as some shoes and some shoe making um, accoutrement. Uh, tonight's program is called Kick Up Your Heels where we are focusing, of course, on some of the uh, pumps or heels that we have in our collection accessories. <clears throat> Before we go into the individual objects, I'd like to go through some of the general history about shoes, just to begin with, give you a little bit of background. The first archaeological evidence of footwear appears uh, about 40,000 years ago from the skeletons of humans found in a, some caves near Beijing. Uh, what they found, are these archaeologists, is that these skeletons had very, very strong leg bones, but they had very thin toe bones. And to them, that suggested that these people were wearing some kind of protection on their feet. About 5,000 years ago, there is artwork in various caves that depict people wearing boots. And Otzi, who was a man that was found frozen in the Otzel Alps, uh, he dates between 34 and 31 BCE. Uh, when he was found, there was evidence of him wearing a pair of leather boots that were lined with hay to keep him warm in this very frigid climate. And these were known as some of the first hiking boots that there is evidence of. Throughout history and in different areas of the world, there are, of course, different kinds of shoes to uh, have to deal with these different kind, kinds of climates. Uh, but one thing that has been found to be kind of universally constant is a predecessor of today's kind of flip-flop sandal. And that's found all over. We know that throughout history, shoes usually were used for function, literally to protect the foot. And it wasn't until later on in our history that shoes began to be used for fashionable reasons. Now the heel specifically, uh, a heeled shoe was first worn in the 10th century and they were actually worn by men. Uh, the, some of the first shoes were used by the Persian cavalry to keep their shoes in their stirrups. Uh, and we know that cowboy boots, of course, are used for the same thing today. Heels were used as a status symbol for men because with using them to keep them in their stirrups, it was a sign of wealth that a man owned a horse, which was a very wealthy, um, kind of rich um, item to own at that time. Heels were introduced to the Western uh, European continent at the end of the 17th century when the Persian Shah sent a delegation of soldiers to forge relations with Russia, Germany, and also Spain. We know that Persian mania or Persian culture and their fashion became very popular among European aristocrats and they adopted heels along with that status symbol of wealth as well as virility and military prowess. Throughout the Middle Ages, just prior to this, there was a version of high heels that are closer to kind of a sandal that would be worn over your shoes to protect you from whatever you were walking in, whether that was dirt or other things, such as things in the field. Uh, of course, we know that King Louis of France, the 14th, or the Sun King, uh, he, of course, in many of his portraits, has these wonderful heeled shoes on. But he passed an edict in 1670 that actually outlawed anyone other than nobility from wearing these heeled shoes. 
it's also because of the French aristocracy wearing these heeled shoes that during the lead up of the French Revolution in the later 18th century, uh, that of course, heels are seen as a symbol of the aristocracy and they fall out of fashion as the nobles um, fall from power. The first pair of shoes that we are going to focus on this evening, the first pair of heels, I should say, uh, are these here, just on top. Uh, these heels were donated in 1987, but they date back to the early 1940s. Now, just 20 years later, in uh, earlier, excuse me, in the 1920s, we saw, of course, in fashion, uh, dresses becoming shorter with the flapper era. Uh, but that's also when shoes, for the first time, were starting to be seen by people other than the wearer or an intimate friend. This was one of the first times that shoes were now being designed to be seen and also to go with certain outfits. The 40s uh, that these shoes come from were a time of practicality and utilitarianism. Uh, and leather, which these shoes do have a leather sole, uh, leather was rationed, of course, with the war effort in the uh, earlier half of the 40s. Uh, women were allowed to purchase three pairs of leather shoes a year, but because, like these shoes uh, that only have a leather sole, they were not rationed. But because of this war rationing, heavier fabrics, um, skins of animals, and satin uh, became more popular. These shoes, because they aren't of an earth tone, kind of these browns and greens um, that were very popular during that time, and also because of their overall um, good condition, these were probably saved for special occasions um, and evenings out. We can also see that with the peak toe and some of the other design um, elements here uh, on the buckle specifically, which I can show you a little bit closer. Um, there are small um, crystals inserted as well, which would be another sign that these shoes were more of a special occasion shoe. We know that the 40s favored a sleek kind of classical feminine style with their heels. We also know that this coincided with Christian Dior's new look, this hyper feminine style um, introduced in 1947. We know that this pair of shoes specifically belonged to the wife of Frederick Green, who was a local artist here in Westport. The second pair of heels that we are going to take a look at are these tan heels right in front of me. Uh, these nude heels are actually in the Mary Jane style. You see that thin ankle strap and buckle um, with a shorter heel, very, very similar to the previous pair that we just looked at. But these shoes, uh, even though they are the same style, are actually from the 1980s, more than four decades later. Uh, fashion, we know still today, swings drastically back and forth between styles and these kind of practical um, short nude heels of the 80s were a direct reaction to, of course, the platform heels and boots of the 60s and 70s. Uh, we also know that there was a boom in women's fashion in the 1980s because, of course, the rise of women in white collar uh, jobs. The shoes were usually kept uh, nude, black, white, kind of these neutral colors um, because they were meant to kind of take a back seat to the more drastic or uh, flamboyant um, pants, skirts, and kind of bold jackets that were taking place in the 80s. These shoes specifically are from the Italian designer Ferragamo who studied anatomy at the University of Southern California. And because of that, when he designed his shoes, uh, they were known for being extremely comfortable and also practical. These shoes specifically were donated by Satnig St. Marie, who served as division vice president of JCPenney for over a decade. And she lived here in Westport. She was the division vice president from 1974 to 1987 and would have worn these shoes during her tenure. The last pair of heels, before we move on to the other items that we're going to look at this evening, uh, are these white wedding shoes. Now these were donated to the museum in 1976, and these date to the Edwardian era, right around the turn of the 20th century. 
These cream silk shoes were slip-ons, of course, a, fair, uh, a different style from the previous two that we've looked at. And these are from the brand Lord & Taylor that of course still exists today. Samuel Lord and George Washington Taylor were English immigrants who founded America's first department store. Uh, it was established in New York City in 1826, and of course, it would go on to be known as Lord & Taylor. These shoes, um, as you can see in a little bit more detail here, uh, they feature a French Louis XIV heel, very, very similar to what the king would have been wearing. Uh, wearing. And you can see on the heel's base, it has almost this crescent moon shape um, to the heel itself. This is a very, very supportive shoe, um, very, very similar to Aragamos. We know that these are bridal shoes also because the, uh, the point shoes and white shoes around 1900 would not have been seen, and they are also in remarkably good condition. Um, white shoes are also much harder to um, clean because they're in such good condition and were not meant to be seen at this point in period. Um, uh, this point in time, rather, uh, they are most likely being worn for a wedding. The fourth pair of shoes, the final pair of shoes we're going to look at, are these uh, baby or children's shoes. Now, for most of human history, uh, children's or infant's shoes were just smaller versions of adult shoes. Uh, they were always important, though. In 1597, in Thomas Delaney's The Gentle Craft, he suggests that shoes for newborns should be included in every midwife's kit. Uh, it really wasn't until the 19th century that baby shoes became different um, from adult shoes. These kinds of um, shoes, these are completely heelless. Uh, this shoe does have a sole, but later, uh, earlier in the period, I should say, with a, without a heel, without a sole, um, a infant's shoe would be called um, cack. Uh, earlier in the 19th century, this term was actually coined in the 1820s. These shoes are actually from the 1890s, um, and though there's no brand on these shoes, from catalogs of the time, it is probably quite a high-end shoe um, for children. The other thing that you can see, and I don't know how much detail you can see um, from your view, but on the side, um, there are these small puncture marks that can be seen. And when these shoes were displayed for sale, the buttons that appear here on the, um, the top side would have actually been placed further out where those little holes were uh, to make the shoe appear smaller. And it was known for both children and for adult shoes that to display a shoe, it would have the button sewn on to look smaller. And then once you got them home, you would actually remove the buttons and uh, have them sewn into the actual size of your foot. Uh, so it is often visible on both children's and adults' boots um, that have, have buttons to have these kind of pin prick holes where they have been uh, moved. The item that you see here, this kind of tall metal item, this is called a shoemaker's last. And this is made up of two pieces. There is the leg and the foot. Uh, the leg of this last is made by the company Perfection Plymouth O. And the foot is made by a company called Malleable and A.L. Now, the foot comes off of the leg, which you can see here, and it actually mimics um, the shape of a foot because the elast was used just like an anvil in order to hammer and form leather shoes um, and to shape them by repairmen and shoemakers. Uh, a last, uh, of course, was made up of the leg, which could be fitted with different types and sizes of foot. Um, to be able to make various different types of shoes. And it makes sense why these two pieces have different brands. This item was donated uh, to the museum by Edith Cooper in 1988. The last item we're going to take a look at is here on the table. And this is a die cut. Uh, 
uh, a die cut was used to process leather and they were actually used to cut um, leather for the shoe industry. You can see that this die was to make a round um, piece, just like a cookie cutter. It's very sharp on the end and it would be laid over top of the leather and then punched through to make the piece that they needed. This particular die cut is from the Boston Shoe Company. And today, Boston is home to the largest shoe industry in America. You can find companies such as New Balance, Alden, Vibram, Reebok, Puma, Converse, Keds, Sperry, Rockport, and Saucony are all based in the city. We also know that the first Shoemakers Guild in America was formed in Boston in 1648. And this particular die cut was donated by Mary Kowalski. So I want to thank all of you for joining the museum for this program. We do, of course, encourage you to add any questions that you have down in the comments box. If you don't have a chance to ask tonight, please do enter them and we will answer you down in the comments box later as well. So thank you again for joining us and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you.